In this video is going to be looking at the last two core practicals for IAS chemistry for unit three of Edexcel's course. The first one that we're going to be looking at is the oxidation of propan one all, which is in topic 10. So the objective of this experiment is to do two different oxidations. The first one is to oxidize propan one all to propanol. And then the second is to oxidize propan one all to propanoic acid. And we can use two different methods for this. For the propanol, we use distillation. And for the pro propanoic acid, we use reflux. So remember, propan 1 all is going to have this structure. And it is a primary alcohol. So primary alcohols can undergo two parts of oxidation. And then firstly, to put it to an aldehyde. And then secondly, to put it to a carboxylic acid. And we can then carry out chemical tests or spectroscopy in order to identify them. So if we look at the apparatus, you can see we're going to need a number of different um, chemicals as well as our actual lab equipment. So we're going to be using things like distillation apparatus, Bunsen burners, measuring cylinders, anti-bumping granules, beakers, thermometers. And in terms of our apparatus, well, we need our oxidizing agent, which is potassium dichromate. We're going to have our alcohol. And then these chemicals are all for our chemical tests. So for safety, of course, we want to wear goggles and our chemical resistant gloves. Be aware that propan 1 all and propanol are both flammable, so we need to keep them away from any naked flame. And of course, avoiding skin contact with our reactants and our products. So firstly, we're going to look at the method for propanol. So we add our acidified potassium dichromate, or our oxidizing agent, remember sometimes written like this in our equation, to a pear-shaped flask, and then we cool it using an ice water bath. And we set it up for distillation, and we add our anti-bumping granules, and that gives us a nice smooth boiling motion. We put 1.5 centimetres cubed of our alcohol into a measuring cylinder, and then we dilute it with five centimetres cubed of distilled water. Using a pipette, we slowly add the propan one all into the pear-shaped flask. And then once we've added all of the propan one all, we cool the flask to room temperature and then light a burner underneath it to gently heat. Okay, this colourless colourless liquid that is given off in a test tube is then immersed into cold water and that should be our aldehyde. So notice that we're adding it slowly here um, and we are not undergoing any reflux. We're doing what we call a distillation by addition. And we'll look at what that looks like in just a minute. Then we have to test for the propanol and we use four different tests. The first one is using Tollens reagent so we add sodium hydroxide to a silver nitrate solution and just enough ammonia to dissolve the precipitate. And this is known as Tollens reagent. We add this then to our distillate. And if we get a silver mirror, then we get a positive test. So a positive test for an aldehyde using Tollens is the appearance of a silver mirror. If we have magnesium ribbon and we add it, there should be no reaction because propanol does not have any effervescence when it reacts with a metal. If we had uh, the sodium hydrogen carbonate to the distillate, again, there should be no effervescence because it does not react. The last test is using failing solution. So we add one centimeter cubed of failing solution to the distillate and then we put it into hot or warm water. And then if we see a color change to a red brown, then it tells us that we have propanol being formed. So that again is a positive test. So the two key tests that we're looking for here is the formation of a silver mirror or a color change to red brown with failings solution. When we're creating propanoic acid, then again, we are using our acidified potassium dichromate and we're cooling it into a water bath. This time we are setting up the flask for reflux as opposed to distillation. 
Now again, using the same method, we measure out our propan 1 oil and then we slowly add it. And once it has been added, then we cool the flask to room temperature and light our burner and then we heat it under reflux gently for 30 minutes. We do then have to undergo distillation after this and using our distillation apparatus and then we collect the colourless gas, sorry, the colourless liquid that is then given off. So the difference here is that we have reflux, then distillation. So when we are testing for propanoic acid, we carry out the same four tests, so the silver mirror, the magnesium ribbon, the sodium hydrogen carbonate and feeling solution. And the two that we want to focus on this time are magnesium ribbon and sodium hydrogen carbonate. If we have formed propanoic acid, we should see no colour change with the silver mirror or with the failing solution. But what we should see is we should see effervescence being formed with the ribbon and the sodium hydrogen carbonate because both of them are able to react with an acid. So these are what the two reactions are going to look like. So we have our distillation on the left hand side for our aldehyde and we have our heating under reflux on the right hand side for our carboxylic acid. Notice that there is a clear difference in our setup but there are some similarities. So we have our condenser, they're just set up slightly differently. The condenser and this one is set up to distill whereas the condenser and this one is set up to catch its volatile products and then put them back into the round bottom flask. So we call that reflux. So when we oxidize alcohols, it is extremely important that we control the conditions. I cannot stress that enough because controlling the conditions determines which products are formed. So the first equation is for the formation of the aldehyde. So you can see that we have our oxidizing agent here. And we just display that as an O in square brackets. And then we can oxidize from the aldehyde to the carboxylic acid. So that's our second oxidation. We can show going straight from the alcohol to the carboxylic acid. We just have to make sure that we show that there are two moles of the oxidizing agent because we need to carry it out twice. Carboxylic acids, whilst they are weak acids, they are still going to react in the same way as other strong acids, such as hydrochloric acid. So let's have a look at a past paper question. This is from the June 2016 paper, and the question is referring to compound E, and this is compound E in the box at the top. So compound E, it can be oxidized with potassium dichromate, acidified with sulfuric acid, and it um, we are using the apparatus below, so we're showing our reflux apparatus. Now we have to be able to label this. So let's just go back to our diagram. So this is the diagram that we want to be able to label. Notice that the cold water goes in at the bottom and the water comes out at the top. And then we have our round bottom flask. So if I go back to my diagram, we're well here at the bottom. I have the water in. And at the top, I have the water out. And in the round bottom flask, I have my reaction mixture. And I also have anti-bumping granules. You get one mark for getting the condensers the right way around and the second mark for getting the anti-bumping granules. Part two is then asking us to look at the technique that is carried out using this apparatus. Well, we've said it a few times now. This is known as heating under reflux or refluxing. Part three, explain how the Liebig condenser works and its purpose and the apparatus showing. Well, this is basically just saying, why do we need a condenser? So what actually happens where well, we have cold water passing through the condenser and the purpose of the cold water is to condense the vapors oh 
of the volatile substances and the purpose of it is to stop any reactants or products from escaping. So because these are volatile substances and they do turn into gases, the condenser is there to condense them back into a liquid and then that stops them from escaping. So the oxidation of E can result in the aldehyde or a carboxylic acid. And we're looking for either the skeletal or the displayed formula here. So you can see that this is hexan one all because we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. We know that then it is a primary um, alcohol because we can get our aldehyde and our carboxylic acid. So we just simply have to draw them out. So we're going to do one, two, three, four, five, six of our carbons double bonded to the, the oxygen for the aldehyde. And for the carboxylic acid, again, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. And then we have our OH group. And again, our double bond to our carboxylic acid. So hexanal and hexan, hexanoic acids. Of course, we're not asked to name them. So by considering the bonds in these two products, explain how infrared spectroscopy can be used to distinguish between them. In this case, we are not expected to give the specific wave numbers. So this is just looking at the difference between the functional groups. So the main difference, there are two possible ways that you can answer this. The first way is the fact that carboxylic acid has an OH group. which is going to absorb at a specific frequency. Okay, and alternatively, you can look at the differences and say, well, the CHO or the aldehyde and the COOH, the carboxylic acid, will each have characteristic peaks. So that's making going not into too much detail where we have to actually name the peaks, but just to show that they do have different peaks. The fact that it's only for one mark, we don't need to go into too much detail. So for I, the carboxylic acid of the oxidation of E produces uh, an oily liquid that boils at 206 degrees. We can obtain the reaction, sorry, the carboxylic acid from the reaction mixture by distillation. Name three pieces of apparatus apart from the clamps and the stands that are essential to convert the apparatus into distillation. So let's just go back and have a look at the apparatus. Well, we had this set up so we now need to think about how we can then condense it or how we can change it. So the first thing that whenever we're doing this is we always have to have our thermometer. We then need to have an adapter or sometimes known as a still head and if I just go back I can show you what that looks like. That is this part here is the still head or your adapter. And then the last thing we need is a collection flask. Which could be conical or a round bottom flask. Either one would be acceptable. Okay, suggesting a suitable temperature over which 
to collect the carboxylic acids of the distillate, but we're told that it boils at 206 degrees. The fact that we're seeing a suitable temperature range means we have to have more than one value. And the mark scheme will allow you from any value from 200 or 205 up to 207 to 212. So by five degrees on each side, we can have a range between that. If you're not too sure, just do one degree on either side so from 205 to 207. That is a perfectly acceptable answer. And then the distillate contains a trace of water, suggests a suitable drying agent. Well, we've covered drying agents in the core practicals six and core practical six, as well as in the unit, sorry, the topic 10 content. So a suitable drying agent would be something like anhydrous calcium chloride. You could also have magnesium sulfate or sodium sulfate. So you can see that we have the mark schemes here. You can have a look at them should you be wishing to try these on your own. Now let's move on to our last core practical, which is number eight. And this is the analysis of known substances. And this is basically chemical tests. So I'm going to show you all of the different types of chemical tests that we can do and what results we should be getting. But what you may wish to do is you may wish to summarise all of this into a map or a, a mind map or some sort of poster, because if you memorise that, it then makes this much easier. So the objective of this experiment is to be given unknown colourless liquids and inorganic solids, and then we have to test using various different methods to identify what these liquids and solids are. So chemical tests you covered back in GCSE, and we've covered quite a lot of diagnostic tests throughout this entire IAS course. And we can use them to identify different molecules or different functional groups. We would then do further analysis like spectroscopy to follow these tests just so that we can completely confirm the whole structures. But in this case, we're going to be looking more for functional groups. So for the apparatus, you're given four unknown inorganic substances and three unknown organic substances and all of the chemicals are going to be used to carry out all of our chemical tests. So we need to do flame tests, feeling solutions, looking for testing for halides, sulfates, carbonates and we're just going to go through each of these in terms of the observations. So for safety of course wear your eye protection and avoiding skin contact Two key things here is that ammonia solution will give off ammonia gas, which should not be inhaled by anyone because it can be harmful, and especially those with respiratory problems. And of course, ethanol is flammable. So what should we do for any inorganic substances? First of all, where we're going to identify firstly the cations, and we identify the cations using flame tests. We can also carry out the sodium hydroxide test. So you learned about these back in GCSE. And we can use those to identify the cations. And I'm going to go through the observations in just a minute. If we are looking for halide ions, we do the silver nitrate test. If we are looking for sulfate ions, we do the barium nitrate test. Both of these are going to give precipitates. And if it wants, we are looking for carbonate ions, we do the hydrochloric acid test because we get effervescence. And then we can take all of that information, put it together, and we can identify both the cation and the anion in these inorganic substances. If we are looking for the organic substances, well, the first test that we'll carry out will be the bromine water test for alkenes. And here, we are looking for a decolorization. That would give us a positive test for alkenes. We can then do the tollens, feeling, or the potassium dichromate for aldehydes, and we should see color changes, and we just mentioned those in the previous core practical. 
If we want to do carboxylic acids, well, we can either do hydrochloric acids to see effervescence, or we can add ethanol, and that is going to form an ester. And we can use all of that information to identify the organic substance. So let's have a look at what results we would expect. First of all, we would have, for flame tests, we need to know our colours. So we've got think, our cations like sodium, potassium and so on, and we need to identify the colours. The key ones that come up a lot are potassium as lilac, lithium and strontium as red, but you can see because we have two of them giving red, we would need to do further tests, and calcium as yellow-red. Those are some of the most common ones, but you do need to know all of them. A question that could come up in Unit 3 is how we actually carry out the flame test. So we use a clean nichrome wire and then we have a sample of our solid compound mixed in with concentrated hydrochloric acid. It is then held in the hot blue flame and we see our colour. If we want to test for the halides then we're going to use the silver nitrate test and we are going to react the compound with dilute nitric acid just to remove any carbonate ions first of all and then we add the silver halide sorry the silver nitrate to make our precipitate and you can see our precipitates are here silver chloride bromide and iodide and of course we need to know our colors and if we then want to distinguish between these because the colors can be quite similar we can then add aqueous ammonia and you can see that we get a different results for each of the three of them, depending on whether it is dilute or concentrated. If we want to test for sulfate ions, we're going to use barium chloride. When this is added, we put the hydrochloric acid first of all, and then we add the barium chloride and we get a precipitate. So we put the, put the Barium chloride first, get the precipitate, and then we add in the hydrochloric acid. My apologies. And then if the if it dissolves, then we're going to be having something like an SO3 or an CO3 ion. If it remains insoluble, then we know that we have an SO4 sulfate ion. We can also add a few drops of concentrated sulfuric acid and this is our reduction reactions and we've covered these in our um, topic 8 uh, for the, the halides and you can see that we get steamy fumes if it's chloride, if it is bromide we get steamy fumes and brown vapour because we also get our bromine formed and if we have iodide we get steamy fumes, purple vapour for our iodine a black solid um, as well as uh, a black solid and a yellow solid as well. So we need to make sure that we know each of these. We can also for halides do a displacement reaction. Of course, our displacement, our reactivity decreases as we go down. So a more reactive substance will be able to displace a less reactive substance and then of course we can add an organic solvent such as hexane and it dissolves in the organic layer and we see a very nice clear colour in our organic layer. So if we have bromine we get a yellow orange organic layer and if we have iodine we get a purple. You may wish to go back and have a look at topic 8 because this will tell you a bit more information about these. We can also look at the decomposition by simply heating and we can look to see what gas is being given off. If we have carbon dioxide gas, we must be having a group 2 carbonate or lithium carbonate because we are getting a decomposition. Again, this is in topic 8 if you want to go back and have a look. If we get oxygen, then we have the group 1 nitrates. If we get oxygen and nitrogen dioxide, then we have the group 2 nitrates or lithium. When we're looking at the organic tests, again, we can ignite them or burn them using um, an, a fume cupboard. If we get a smoky flame, then we're going to get something that is unsaturated because we're getting a lot of incomplete combustion.
If we get a nice clean flame, we have a saturated low mass compound. And that is because we have more complete combustion. And if we get no residue at all, then we're going to get something that has got quite a low molar mass. Then we've got all of our different reactions for our organic tests. So I'm not going to go through all of them. I will let, leave it up so that you can have a look at it. Or of course, you could pause the video. So just to confirm some key ones. So we've got our bromine for our alkene. We can be testing for our alcohols or our aldehydes using the potassium dichromate, feelings and tollens. We can, of course, also have our halogenal alkenes with our silver nitrate or our PCL5. Now, at AS, you do not need to worry about this one and you also do not need to worry about this one. These two are covered at A2 level. And of course, we can also have our carboxylic acid by reacting it with ethanol and forming an ester. So let's actually use this um, all of these chemical tests and let's look at our past paper question. So this is a question from June 2019 paper and we're going to go through the organic question and an inorganic question. So our inorganic compounds A and B both contain one cation and one anion and we carry out a number of different tests and we want to be able to complete the formulae or the name of the ions and the gas. So if we have a lilac flame, our cation is going to be potassium. Potassium is always our lilac flame and notice that it's specific about the cation. If you just write K, you will not get the mark. A sample of A is then heated where we get a colourless gas which relights a glowing splint. Well, that is a positive test for oxygen, of course, being diatomic, so it's O2. And the anion then, if we have oxygen being formed when it's heated, it must be a nitrate, which is NO3 minus. For test two, we want to write the equation for the reaction. Well, this is basically asking us to write a decomposition equation. So we know that the reaction or the substance, as we've just seen from part one, is going to be KNO3 or potassium nitrate. We are going to heat it to decompose and we're going to form our potassium nitrite because it is in group one and oxygen. Of course, we need to make sure that we balance it. So we have two and two, and that would give us our answer for the decomposition. Remember, this is a group one. So we make the nitrite plus oxygen. For part B, uh, the cation in group B is form formed from a metal of group two, very important. Um, and we carry out a number of tests. So for test number three, we're going to have a flame test that gives us a crimson red flame. Now we said that could either be lithium or strontium, but of course it is in group two, so it has to be strontium. So our cation is SR2+. For test four, we're going to add a few drops of sulfuric acid and we form a white precipitate. What is the white precipitate? Well, the precipitate is going to be strontium sulfate and then test five is adding dilute nitric acid and the aqueous silver nitrate and we get a cream precipitate this time so the anion is bromide So then we want to write the ionic equation for the reaction in test four. So this is the reaction of the group two with our, our, our sulfuric acid and we're making our sulfate. So that's going to be SR2 plus and it says include state symbols this time plus SO4 two minus giving us SRSO4, and of course it's a precipitate, so it's going to be our solid. 
So the student who carried out test five recorded a white precipitate and we want to distinguish between the two possible anions. So how do we do this? Well, we're going to add dilute ammonia. And if it was a chloride, it would dissolve. And if it was a bromide, it does not dissolve. Okay, so we always need to make sure that we can distinguish between our halide ions and we always do that using our dilute or our concentrated ammonia. In this case, we have to be very specific that it is adding dilute ammonia. Our concentrated ammonia would not give us the result that we are looking for. If we then look at question two, which is looking at our organic compound. So we want to carry out our tests on organic compound D, which has the molecular formula C4H8O. When we add a small amount of reagent X, we get a gas that is giving off steamy fumes, and then it turns the litmus paper red. So turning litmus paper red tells us that we have chlorine gas, and it tells us that it has an OH group. So our reagent X is going to be P. Cl5, or phosphorus 5 chloride. Identifying the steamy fumes that are produced in test one by the name or formula, well, it is HCl gas, or hydrogen chloride. For test two, we're adding a few drops of reagent Y, and then the orange-brown reagent turned colorless, and that tells us that it contains a double bond. Well, that's asking us how do we test for uh, unsaturation. So we are adding bromine water. Part B is then looking at the mass spectrum of D and it includes peaks at 15 and 31. And we need to identify the peaks that cause these. So our peak at a uh, mass charge ratio of 15, hopefully we remember from our mass spec topic that that is always a methyl. So it's CH3 and we always have our positive charge, which is the plus. And the peak at 31, well, we know we're probably going to have some um, an oxygen in there and we're also going to have our carbons. So the peak is C CH2OH+. Plus. The molecular formula of compound D we've said is C4H8O. It has a branched chain structure and we have functional groups on two different carbon atoms. And we want to use that information to deduce the structure of D. So we have four carbons. We must have an alcohol and we must, it has a branch and we must have a double bond. So if we have four carbons, one of the CH3s must be our double bond must be our branch. So that leaves us with a structure of three carbons, one of which has to have a double bond. Your CH3 is going to be in the center. For our branch, it has to be. This is going to be our hydrogens. And we've said that the groups are on different carbons. So that will be a hydrogen, then our OH and another hydrogen. And that's our structure. I know that's a bit cramped, so I apologize if you can't see it. I'll rewrite it down here. So there's our structure. Part D is then looking at cyclobutanol, which also has the same molecular formula of C4H8O. And by considering the bonds in cyclobutanol and the bonds that are in D, describe how the infrared spectroscopy would distinguish between these two compounds. Again, we don't have to give the specific wave number. Well, the biggest difference here is that the D contains a double bond and cyclobutanol does not. So D will have a peak corresponding to a CC bond. 
and cyclobutanol will not. So making sure to compare and contrast between those two things. Okay, so if you want to check your, um, your answers for these questions, you can have a look at the mark schemes for question one and the mark schemes for question two. That's everything for core practicals seven and eight, and that covers now all of the core practicals for unit three of the AS. I hope this video has been useful. If you do have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment below and check back on the YouTube channel for any further videos that you might find useful.